So thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some research I've been doing for a couple of years now with my colleagues David and Mark on this man, William King, and uh, the naming of the Neanderthals. And particularly with regards to this session, what I wanted to look at is was the process by which this happened and, and, and the way in which we remember this event, is it accurate, is it fair, and why is it significant? So I thought I'd start off by giving a bit of an introduction to who William King was, because I suspect quite a few of you probably don't know who he is or don't know that much about him. Take a step back and think about why Neanderthals matter when we talk about the history of prehistory. Why do they matter at all, in fact? Uh, look a little bit at the circumstances, uh, how Homo neanderthalensis came to be accepted as the name that we use for the species, and then finally reflect upon what this means for how we remember King. So who was William King, apart from a grumpy looking Victorian gentleman? <laughs> this is one of only two, no he doesn't look particularly happy in that one either, this is one of only two known photographs we have of this man. Um, he was a self-taught geologist and paleontologist. He was born in Sunderland in the northeast of England uh, in 1809. And I can tell you now that if you're an aspiring academic in the Victorian period, that is not the greatest of starts in life. But he made it. He was entirely self-taught and he made waves in the circles he inhabited of the local intellectual communities, the Sunderland Philosophical Society. And he gained employment at the Great North Museum in Newcastle, where he was the first salaried curator there. He didn't have a great time there. He uh, was dismissed uh, after a dispute with his employers over ownership of collections. We won't go too much into it, but it cast a bit of a shadow over him. Um, but he bounced right back. In 1849, he became chair of geology and mineralogy at Queen's College Galway, a newly established position. He stayed there for the rest of his life. Uh, he became professor of natural history later on. He was awarded the college's first DSC, which is an indication of how high esteem he was held in by his colleagues. Um, and he died there, I think, in 1886 or thereabouts. It's a fairly solid, if unremarkable, career, but he did have several notable scientific contributions. Um, he became quite an important person in Irish geology. He's one of the few non-native geologists out there at this time, and he was also rather forward-thinking compared to a lot of his peers out there with regards to concepts such as evolution in his teaching. He wrote a very important book about Permian fossils only nine years after the Permian was indeed established, which is still cited by paleontologists as an exemplary text. And he engaged in various other important discussions such as uh, the uh, veracity of the Iazoon fossil, which was an important scientific dispute of the day. And of course he gave us the name Homo neanderthalensis. He obtained a cast of the Feldhofer one cranium uh, from Germany. He had a look at it, he had a look at some comparative material, he drew his own conclusions and this is what he came to tell us. And this is huge. This is absolutely huge because what he's just done, and no one really thinks about this, is he's become the first person to say we are not the only species in the Homo genus, right? So when we think about the 1800s and we think about this fascinating time period of discovery of our past and particularly the human past, we have all these things going on. People discovering dinosaurs and coming to terms with what they are. People are beginning to get to grips with the uh, geological time depth. Uh, the antiquity of, of man <coughs> published and all these kind of things. Darwin's evolution, <coughs> the origin of species. Um, the Royal Anthropological Institute this time, in the 1860s, when William King made his announcement, is bitterly divided over concepts such as race and species and language. And this stuff is very much permeating into popular culture. Journey to the Centre of the Earth was published uh, in 1864, the same year Homo Neanderthensis comes into print. Um, uh, for those of you that haven't read it, the Verne talks about coming face to face with these cavemen of the past. So this is all happening and yet we don't really have a period or a moment rather that you might think we would where we go hang on what about the gunshot moment where we realize that humans aren't entirely unique or entirely alone within our evolutionary lineage this is where i wanted to step back and talk about well, why does this matter and i think today when we think about neanderthals they fascinate us 
because there are two things that people always want to know. One is what's the earliest? What's the first thing you can see that looks like us, that, 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 that has a part to play in our origin story? And the second thing people want to know is what's the next best thing and our closest relative, as far as we can tell, were the Neanderthals. And that dominates the way we talk about prehistory. We want to know why are we different and why are we still here, and this permeates throughout all these sort of textbooks that dominate what we do. Everything we do, because we are the first, we didn't know anything else, we knew us and then we find other hominins, is relative to us. And we want to know why did we succeed? And so now we have enough information that we can ask questions like, well, why did we succeed and why did they fail? Because we know that these two stories appear to be very much intertwined. We didn't really know that when King made this announcement and we didn't really know anything much. But we did know that we needed to <coughs> rationalize differences in the fossils we were finding. We need to say what's different and why, is it, why it's important. So, Onto a brief timeline for what happened here. The skull itself was found in 1856 by Anne Fulrod, and it was presented to some German academics by his colleague Hermann Schaffhausen. It was widely rejected in Germany, but that might have been why it was a bit of a delay. But in 1861, George Busk translates the paper and adds an addendum, which brings it to the attention of the English academic community. In 1863, in his native northeast of England, this is Newcastle, it doesn't look any better today. Uh, the, well, the, um, the British Association for the Advancement of Science meeting is held in Newcastle. King attends on a rare trip out of Ireland and he presents his findings to very little fanfare that he thinks this is a new species. At the same time, We've got all these books, as I said earlier, Lyle and Huxley coming out, and Huxley himself engages with King on his position, and Huxley's view is really in Britain the one that becomes mainstream accepted. And of course, a year or two later, it's all forgotten because there's new, prettier things to play with. And the Gibraltar specimen isn't accepted as a Neanderthal at this point, although they remark, uh, Falconer and Busk who present it, remark that it does bear similar similarities to the Feldhofer skull. So what happened? Why did Homo neanderthensis not take off? Um, it, it just wasn't seen as the most likely answer. Uh, with time, more specimens come to light and people begin to accept that there must be other species. Uh, Homo primigenius becomes popular, certainly in Germany, thanks to people like Gustav von Schwal. Primigenius implying that this is ancestral to us, whereas Neanderthalensis, as King put forward, implies that it is not ancestral to us. And then the first resurrection, as far as we can tell, of the term Homo Neanderthalensis comes from Edward Drinker Cope talking about the discovery of Java Man in 1896. Um, we don't really know how he came to know this term or why he used it then, but this is the earliest we know. Really, why we have Homo Neanderthalensis is because of Marcel and Ball. Uh, who becomes the main figure in Neanderthal paleoanthropology and archaeology for about 40 years when he does his work on La Chapelle. How he knows of King's work, I also couldn't tell you, but I do know that William King was a member of the French Society for Geology and he was awarded a medal. So it's quite possible that a French anatomist like Ball might have encountered his work that way. I'm not sure, but again, he emphasises this idea, which prevails for a long time, that Neanderthals are very primitive, very different from ourselves, and so he reverts back to Neanderthalensis instead of primigenius, because that is seen, you know, how could we possibly have come from this species? So what does this leave us with William King? If you read a book like Paul Miller's Neanderthal Legacy, and I can say this because I work for the guy, he's not in there. He doesn't feature in these pages. And similarly, if you find books where he is mentioned, he's rarely anything more than a footnote if you read books by a lot of these eminent people, Klein and Tattersall and Trinkhaus and all. Um, and when he is talked about, he's often not remembered ever so favourably. Uh, I think his days in Newcastle didn't help. He's seen as somewhat cavalier. He's a geologist, so he's not really in a position to talk about this stuff. He talked about the possibility that this might be a separate genus even, and these words are often taken out of context. He's not really remembered, and when he is, it's not always very favourable. Um, 
I just like these images. <coughs> cool. I just like these images because they uh, sort of bring us on to the final thoughts about this. We've come an awful long way from William King's initial assertion about Neanderthalensis, and yet, in many respects, we're still discussing the same sorts of things that Huxley and everyone are talking about. We want to know how different Neanderthals were and why, if they were different, were they different? We still look at things like bone morphology and stuff, but what we do do now, which we couldn't do back then, is we can actually look at behaviours through the archaeological record, of course. And in terms of King, well, we accept Neanderthalensis now, but we didn't at the time, not within his lifetime. Um, And it's not necessarily because he was a, a rubbish, I swear on camera, rubbish scientist, as some people might have us believe. I've looked through his work extensively and tried to contextualise it within that of his peers, people like George Busk and everyone. He was respected by these people to varying degrees. Um, It just didn't win out there and then. And we have to remember these things in terms of the success of a theory rather than was this true? Was this scientifically right or wrong? King's methods and, and approaches were fine for the time and that's what we need to bear in mind. It didn't win out then, it was vindicated subsequently, he was not necessarily profound, he just happened to be prophetic. So, why do we need to think about this sort of thing? Well, William King only wrote about this twice, and then he went back to his normal geology stuff, didn't really concern himself with human evolution again. Um, I think it's simply right to try and reflect on our own ideas and prejudices and rectify these things, it's good to be very critically aware of our own positions and the roots of our ideas. And so it's uh, becoming an edifying process for us as prehistorians to be aware of these things and set the record straight. William King's name is much better known now, thanks to conferences such as this. There's been a raft of papers on him recently, which I could point anyone in the direction if they're not bored silly yet. Um, Other than that, I'd just like to thank you all for listening and thank the hosts for having me. Thank you very much. (laughs) 